Yeah, so we we finished Bandits, which was the most basic uh, Monte Carlo setting you could think of. And now we're going to see how we can apply those ideas uh, to something we're going to call policy improvement, um, which is a pretty useful thing to know uh, in a practical setting. Uh, so I've, I've seen this used quite a bit. Um, and... Yeah, this really isn't covered in the textbook, but uh, but I, I think the, the slides are relatively self-contained. Um, all right, so so basically here, what we're going to be doing, you you want to think about uh, you are coming into a problem that uh, you already have a policy for, and it, it may not be well, it's not going to be the optimal policy because then we won't have anything. Uh, useful to do, um, but they have some policy. It might be a heuristic policy. And so uh, the example I gave last time was in networking. There's lots of policies for how you serve packets, for example. Uh, you know, TCP IP has lots of variants. Um, and one thing you might want to do is improve that. And one way that you might improve that is if I give you a simulator of the network, um, somehow you could use that simulator uh, with that policy to figure out a way to uh, online as you're as you're sort of serving packets to improve the packet serving policy. And so, and I'll show you some other examples at the the end of the uh, this section. For example, where you know they have policies for uh, managing an electrical grid when things start to go bad. Um, those are often sort of hand-tuned policies, and, and you might like to be able to use some techniques to improve them if you have a simulator. So what you want to think about is you have this agent who's acting in the real world, and in addition to this world simulator, they have a base policy that you give them. And uh, later on, we'll see you could actually give them more than one base policy. But you have a base policy, and our goal is to select actions in the environment. And one thing we'd like to do is uh, improve on the base policy. Like that's ideally why we're trying to do this. We're presumably going to use more time thinking than if we just were to apply the base policy. We're thinking usually you think of the base policy here as something that's really fast. Um, but one another thing we'd like to make sure of is that we don't end up doing worse than the base policy, right? So so we'd like to have some guarantee that. Uh, you're not going to do all this work and then end up running this thing and it does worse than the base policy and the people you're working for will say, well, thanks a lot. That was that was really useful. So uh, so that's something that uh, we'll, we'll talk about as well. You'd like to be able to guarantee improvement or at least guarantee that you don't get worse. Right? That, that's ultimately what, what you'd like to do. All right, so we're going to call this Monte Carlo policy improvement uh, for, for the reasons that should, should be fairly obvious. All right, so so uh, to get into this, we just want to refresh our memories about uh, policy iteration, um, which was basically based on the policy improvement uh, theorem. Uh, and so, so we saw this uh, at the beginning of the course, pretty much. And so, so if we just remember, this was the Q function for a uh, policy. So Q pi SA was just the expected value of taking action A in state S and then following pi after that, right? Uh, so, uh, and this is the equation that you get. Um, in fact, uh, this equation has a bug in it. Anybody see the bug in this equation? No, no, it doesn't have a bug, sorry. Um, I thought this should be pi, but, but it should not be pi because we're saying we're taking this action. So the transition has to be based on A. Um, okay, so, so that's the Q function. And then we said that pi prime, if we define it as the action that maximizes the Q function, uh, that policy is guaranteed to be better than pi if pi isn't already optimal. Right? So, so we basically, you know, and a lot of the reinforcement learning algorithms are based on this. If you can get your hands on the Q function of a policy, you have an immediate way to improve the policy. All right, so the way when we started the course that we got our hands on the Q function of the policy is we just 
would would compute it, right? We would uh, we we would usually do that indirectly. We would compute the value function of the policy, and then we'd use that to basically work through this equation. Uh, but we could also have used Q iteration, right, to get get the Q value for a policy. In reinforcement learning, we use lots of experience in the world to try to get a Q function, and usually we were oh we were never really settling on a Q function for a particular policy, but they were always sort of learning a Q function and improving the policy at the same time. Uh, here, we want to use a Monte Carlo uh, simulator, a, a strong simulator to uh, approximate the Q function. And, and that's going to be the basis for the first, first uh, policy improvement technique. Um, so basically, using a simulator to, uh, to effectively um, compute this line here uh, to approximate pi prime. All right. Um, so, so the the difference between now and, and when we first did policy iteration is when we did policy iteration, we computed pi prime across the entire state space. Right. That's uh, that that was what we did, and then we used that policy to compute the value function, and again compute the next policy. Uh, in the series across the entire state space. Now we only care about computing pi prime at this one state s that we happen to be in, and we want to take an action, right? So, so think of it as, you know, this agent is in a particular state. We want to take an action. We want to do some Monte Carlo stuff in the agent's head that will give us what pi prime would return at that single state, and we take that action. Then we'll get to a new state, and then we can again compute what pi prime would return at just that state. So we're only going to compute pi prime at the states we actually encounter as opposed to computing them everywhere because uh, we can't compute them everywhere. There's too many states. All right, so this is something we call online planning. You only really uh, sort of focus the computation on the places you end up. So does that make sense? Right. So, uh, so we have to have a way of computing pi prime at a particular state. That's the uh, without computing it everywhere. That's sort of the the trick that, that we need to figure out. All right, and to do that, we're going to think of it as a bandit problem. And so, so we we like this is this is the equation we want to approximate. Um, we want to approximate getting the action that maximizes the Q function. Um, and so, so one thing, so this is just, you know, a thought experiment. One thing you might try to do is just, uh, here's a bandit problem for you, right? And so when you pull this bandit arm, you're going to get the, uh, you, we're going to return the reward um, for action A. Now, if we were to solve this bandit problem to, to try to identify the best arm, would this basically give us pi prime, pi prime at S? Or would it give us something else? Right, so pi prime at S should maximize the Q function. Uh, what, what do we get if we sort of use the banded algorithm to find the best R? Right, this is a not a trick question. It's going to return an action that maximizes what? It's going to maximize the Q function. What's down here? So this bandit, if we pull this, we get the reward, right? Um, what's the expected value of this bandit arm? Right, we're in one state. We pull the arm, and we get the reward for that state action pair. If we pull the arm again, we get another sample of the reward for that state action pair. We pull the arm again, we get another sample of the state the reward for that. So what, what's the expected value of that arm? The expected reward, right? The expected immediate reward, right? So, so we're just trying to do a little thought experiment to see how you formulate these things as bandit problems. If we solve this bandit problem, we're going to find the action that has the highest expected immediate reward. Right? And that's different than the highest Q value. Right? The immediate reward is only sort of the first part of the Q function. Uh, it does not take into account the future. Right? So, 
So that's how you want to, you know, we want to think about this. We've set up a bandit problem. Each bandit is associated with a, uh, each arm is associated with a uh, function. Here the function happens to be just the reward function. And if we solve it, we do not maximize the Q function. We find the best expected immediate reward. All right. So, no, we would find a star that maximizes this. So, good that we did that, if that, that wasn't clear. Um, so now, so, so basically, if we want to solve, if we want to solve this as a bandit problem, we, we need to have different functions associated with each arm, right? So let's, uh, let's look at this. So we're going to define functions here. And th these are functions that we're going to just write code for. And they're going to use our Monte Carlo transition function and our Monte Carlo reward function. So we'll, we'll see what this is. But we're, going to, we're going to call this function simq. Um, and it has parameters, the state, an action, and a policy. Um, so we're going to somehow define a function simq. And what we'd like to do is have... Uh, the expected value, so if you run this function many, many times, it's a random function, if you average all the numbers, it's going to give you the expected Q, the Q value of A1 in S. Right? So this is going to be a randomized function, but if you run it many, many times, you want, it to, you want the average to basically be the Q value. And in other words, the expected value of sim Q should be the Q value. And if that was the case, then if you run this bandit, if you run a bandit algorithm to find the best arm on this problem, you're going to identify the arm with the highest Q value. Does that make sense? Right. So every time we pull this arm, we get sort of a sample of the Q value, and, and uh, we want the highest expected Q value. So, I don't know, does anybody have an idea about how one would implement a SIMQ function? Right, this SIMQ function? Any ideas? So, a probabilistic policy, you can just run the policy, but it's a 10 step check. Mm -hmm. yeah. You get the cumulative reward. Okay, so, uh, so he's, he's basically saying, well, we could just run the policy somehow, right? So we, given our simulator, we have the, the ability to take any actions we want, whenever we want, wherever we want. So we, we could just, if we want to simulate like the Q value of A and S, we, we could say, okay, we're, let's look at the definition of the Q function. It says the Q function takes action A and then follows policy pi thereafter. So you could simulate taking action A and then following policy pi and, and add up all the rewards along there, and that would give you a sample of, of sort of the Q value. And if you did that many, many times and you average the results, you get something that's very close to the Q value. All right? So, yeah, it's really, really just simulation. So there, there is a little catch. Um, so this is what we just said, but uh, you know the Q value is defined over an infinite horizon, which uh, you know that's we're not going to be able to simulate for an infinite horizon, right? Now, now he said you know simulate for you know a fixed number of steps or something like ten steps. Uh, so, so we but what we'd like to make sure that uh, we're simulating long enough so that. Uh, we're going to approximate the true infinite horizon Q function reasonably well, right? And so why, why might we expect that we can do a finite simulation and approximate the uh, infinite horizon Q function somewhat well? Is there uh, some property that we know of the value function that, that would help us here? Right. So you now we're saying the, the true Q function is defined over the infinite horizon, right? Um, 
well, we, yeah, it's defined like this uh, recursively, um, but we have this discount factor. Um, and now we're saying we want to approximate that with a finite simulation. And so why, why would we ever expect a finite simulation to ever closely approximate an infinite simulation? Because the value function of the infinite simulation actually converts. It converges, yeah. I mean, it, it's a well. It ha, ha, it's going to be finite, right? right? And why is it finite? Because like that is like the sum of kind of geometric mm -hmm. Right, discounting, right? Discounting. Yeah. So we have a discount factor, and so the the far future eventually becomes unimportant with a discount factor. So even though we talk about infinite horizon, right? Effect, effectively. You know, we talked about this horizon time, effective horizon time. Effectively, um, the future after the horizon time doesn't matter. Uh, and so what we can do is we can just define for the purposes of, you know, Monte Carlo simulation, a uh, truncated Q function that only simulates H minus one steps of the policy. So it simulates taking action A and state S and then H minus one <coughs> steps after that. And this, uh, I think early on we showed some sort of approximation like this, but, but basically the truncated Q function, like this, the value of this is, you know, gonna, gonna be close to the, uh, the infinite horizon Q function and it's this close. So, uh, you, you know, the error goes down exponentially with age. Right? And, We've seen this uh, this result before, right? So uh, so basically, you can make a, you can choose h so it's large enough so this difference this error is as small as you want. Um, so that's sort of the first source of error, though. When you're when you're talking about using Monte Carlo simulation, well, you have to have a finite horizon necessarily because we're actually doing this on a computer and we don't have infinite time. So, uh, so finite horizon, that's the first approximation we're making, and, and it can be bounded in this way. All right, so any questions about this? All right. So, so we're going to reformulate our problem now to uh, basically we're going to create this function sim q, and now we're going to have the h. Right? So sim q h, and this is something we'll actually be able to implement. Um, we'll be able to implement taking action a, a1 in this case, and state S, uh, and then uh, following pi for H minus one steps. And the expected value of this function, we want it to be equal to the expected value of this truncated Q function, right? the finite horizon Q function. And how can we implement that? Well, this is the actual code. Really simple. Um, I'll show you a picture of this first. So, uh, you know, what, what, what the code does, if you're calling it for action A1, it's going to take A1, use a simulator. Um, well, first it's going to get the reward for whatever that action was. Then it's going to use a simulator to get the next state, right? So remember, R and T are things that we're given. They're part of our Monte Carlo representation of the MDP. So these are just functions we're given that we can call. And you get the next state, and then for h minus 1 steps, well, we're just going to keep track of this cumulative reward, discounting it appropriately. Um, every step we apply our policy, and then we update the next state. And at the end, we return this discounted cumulative reward. All right, so there's nothing fancy here. You could all write this algorithm, in fact, you pretty much have already. You, you've written this algorithm. Uh, uh, you've written code that evaluates policies. That's more or less all this is doing. It's just taking an arbitrary action on the first step. Um, and this is what it would look like. And so this would be one sample of our truncated Q function. Right? It's a one concrete sample. And if you run this an infinite number of times and average of the results, it will uh, converge to the, the true value of the truncated Q function. Okay, so any uh, questions about this? Right, it's really, really pretty straightforward after you 
after you see it, right? We, we can use simulation to approximate Q values. All right, so, so now, now we basically have set up a bandit problem, right? And so our bandit problem, we associate this function with each of the arms, right? So the only thing that changes here is the, the action that we, we feed in. So this function is associated with each arm, and whenever you pull arm one, uh, you're going to run this and get a value back, and the same thing for all the other arms, right? And so we want to apply a bandit algorithm to find the arm that has the highest expected value. Um, in other words, the highest uh, truncated Q function value. And so, uh, you know, what, what bandit algorithm would you want to use here, do you think? What would be a reasonable one to try? What's the simplest one? Uniform was pretty simple, right? Um, so if you want to do uniform, it's going to look like this, right? So you're going to pick a W, um, which is your the number of times you pull each arm. And this is what the whole computation will look like, right? You're going to be... Each arm, you're going to pull it W times. Each time you pull, you're going to get a Q value estimate. And you would average these and return the arm that has the best average. Right? And so when we're dealing with Monte Carlo algorithms, what you're generally interested in is uh, the computational complexity. You think of it in terms of the number of simulator calls that you need to make. That's often the thing that dominates the time because the, the simulator is sometimes expensive. And so we can look at the number of simulator calls here um, and, and, and figure out the, the complexity. So, so how many simulator calls are there here? We should be able to just look at this diagram and figure it out. So, so H times uh, W times how many actions? Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, so it's not not complicated. Um, we're just basically counting how many of these little transitions there are. So there are k actions, and each action we're going to try W times, so kW, and each uh, of those trials we have to call the simulator uh, H times, which is the horizon. So. I think that's a KWH, um, right? I thought I had that somewhere in the slides. It's probably somewhere in the slides. I don't know where. But uh, anyway, that, that's the complexity of this. So pretty straightforward. And, and this, this will actually work pretty well for you in a lot of cases. Um, and this is what it looks like, just to make sure you have the right mental picture. If you're running this in the real world, um, yeah, you always want to keep track when you're doing these algorithms. What's the real world and what's the simulated world? And so in the real world, you're in a particular state, and then you're going to be doing all of this simulation, right? And you can see why, why we need a strong simulator. We always need to be able to reset back to this initial state, and, uh, and, 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 and this, this state that we need to reset to could be arbitrary. Um, so we start out in some state S. We do all of this stuff. We figure out the best action. Maybe it's A2. And then we take A2 in the real world. We end up someplace. And then we would do this whole thing for this state. And we would do that at every state. And, you know, and so here's another state. Now this would be different from S, but we would just do this whole computation again. Right? And maybe AK is selected, and we would just keep on going. Okay? So each step, you're going to be doing all this work. And that's a lot more work than just applying the original policy. Right? Applying the original policy basically is just you know, applying the policy to one of these dots. That's really fast. And, and in fact, actually, when you start dealing with neural networks, uh, I, I talked about the simulation time as being a dominating factor. If you have a big neural network, applying the neural network can also be a big factor. Because at uh, every 
every state in our simulation here, we have to both apply the transition function, then find the action that the neural network would select at that state, and then apply the transition function for that action. So, uh, so you have to evaluate the policy. Well, you have to run the policy, which could involve this big neural net, and then run the simulator. So, so both of those can be expensive. Um, which one's more expensive depends on the application. All right, so, so this is what, what I call policy rollout, uh, the most basic version. And you'd be surprised at how effective it can be. Um, in some domains, you can just start with a random policy and basically solve it. So cart pull, um, for example, if you start with a random policy and you do this, you'll have a pretty good policy after that. Um, uh, you're going to be spending more time at each step than, than just evaluating the random policy, but, but it can, can work pretty well. Um, and, and the interesting thing is this is actually essentially doing one step of policy iteration. Right? But you're not computing policy iteration for all the states at once. You're just doing it for the states that you get to. So, uh, so that's how you can think of it. You're sort of starting with a policy and you're now actually able to run the policy that would come up if you were able to run policy iteration for one step on the entire MDP. Um, all right. So, so this is uniform. Oh, I guess he, here's, here's the... Uh, Number of calls, we've already figured that out, KHW. All right, so, and, and you can all, I don't want to spend much time on this. You can also get a PAT guarantee for this. Um, so one, one thing you can do, well, the, the type of guarantee you can get is on the Q value, the, the value of the, uh, the Q function that you return. So, so if we say that uh, A star is a true action that maximizes the Q function, right, the, the true improved action, and then a prime is what we return, right? This is going to be a random, this is a random variable because this is a random function. Um, then, you know, using the packed results that we derived and, and also this H result, we can show this thing here. This is, this is just adding up the different sources of error. This is sampling error, right? This is from the pack result. And you can make this smaller by making W bigger. And this is the sort of horizon error. Um, and you can make this smaller by making your horizon bigger. Right? So, so there's sort of two sources of error, the width and the, and the depth. And, and which one is going to bite you worse depends on the application. Um, but, yeah, there, there's a little caveat here. So this, this result doesn't necessarily guarantee that this policy, right, this is a policy, is going to be close in value to the improved policy. Um, so, so, so I'll give you the, the bad news first. So, so let, let's first try to make sure we understand what I'm talking about here. So, so this procedure is a policy. We give it a state. It does all of this simulation and it returns an action. And we're interested in, well, we'd like that policy to basically be as good as the true Pi prime, the true policy you get if you ran policy iteration. It turns out that you can't do that, um, can't make that guarantee very easily. Um, in other words, just guaranteeing that the Q values we get are close um, isn't enough to, to, to make this guarantee. And so in general, for any fixed H and W, uh, you can find some MDPs where uh, the quality of the rollout policy and of this policy are arbitrarily different. Um, it's kind of weird, but, uh, but you can come up with these weird MDPs where a small difference in the Q value estimate can make this difference. So you take an action A prime instead of A star, even though they have the same, very similar Q values, um, the, the improved policies are going to be very different. Um, I'm not going to give you this MDP. It's very pathological, um, but let's look at what we can guarantee. Um, and again, I'm not going through these uh, results in detail. What you can guarantee is if we make an assumption about the MDP, um, and I'll tell you what that is in a moment, um, we can pick H and W large enough so that we can guarantee we're close to the value of pi prime. 
Um, and the assumption that we have to make is we have to assume something about the, uh, the minimal difference between the Q value of the best action and the second best action. So if this difference is very, very small, uh, then you're going to, it ends up that you're going to have to use smaller, you're going to have to use larger values of W and H. Um, and if it's very, very large, then you can use smaller values. So basically you have to do, your error has to be small enough so that you can distinguish between the best and the second best. Um, but that, that makes an assumption about the MDP, which you usually don't know what that number is. You don't usually know what's the difference between the best and the second best beforehand. So, so that, that's what you can do if you know that information. But there is other good news. So, so it is possible to select H and W so that um, our policy is not going to be worse than the original policy. Right? So we're, we're doing this rollout, right? And like I said in the beginning, we at least want to guarantee that we're not going to return something that's worse than the policy we're given because that – that would be kind of bad, right? You're, you're doing this for a customer and they say, hey, improve my policy. And you come back and now your algorithm's taking more time and it's doing worse. So that, that would be really bad. So, so you can actually uh, pick these values and we're, we're not going to go through details of this so that, um, yeah, you can get this guarantee at least. So that's, that's something. Um, and, you know, for those of you that are curious, you can... You can pick the values based on this and your your guarantee compared to the um, original policy will you're not going to you're not going to be any worse than this much worse than the original policy and you can make that as small as you want all right so so at least that's you know that, that's some that's some guarantee and then anything else any improvement you get is sort of bonus right and so, so you're expecting that you're going to see improvement just because that's empirically what you tend to see. But, uh, but if not, you know you're not going to do worse, and you have a guarantee of that. So that, that's the real important thing um, to, to make sure of. All right, so any, any questions about this stuff? All right. Um, so, yeah, th this stuff we, we can go over fairly quickly. So... So we just showed the uniform policy rollout where we were pulling every, we were trying every action the same number of times. Uh, with bandits, we also looked at non-uniform algorithms that pull the arms different numbers of times, right? And we said, oh, that's probably going to be more efficient. So we, we you know, the non-uniform algorithms came up in two cases. One was when we were trying to minimize the cumulative regret, right? This was UCB. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the algorithm we came up with. And so, so just so you remember, cumulative regret was we're actually keeping track of the rewards or the, or that we get from each poll as we actually do all the polling. And we want that to be um, as large as possible. Right? We, want, we want to get as much reward as we sort of do the exploration as possible. Where simple regret was different, right? We only care about uh, the reward at the end, right? Could we identify the best arm or not? We didn't care about the accumulated reward during. And so for policy rollout, do we care about minimizing cumulative regret for this bandit problem? And what would that even mean? What, what is uh, the cumulative regret here? Let's think about what cumulative regret is. So, so during rollout, we're pulling each arm ends up doing this simulation. At the end, we return, we get a number, right? This, this Q value here, this Q estimate, this is effectively the reward for this arm for that pull. Then, then we saw this reward, then we saw this reward, and then we saw this reward. Um, the cumulative value is sort of the sum of all of these. Right, the sum of all of the these uh, these returns that you get during the rollout simulation process, and we don't really, I mean, we, we don't really care too much about this 
some being big and good, right? All we care about at the end is that we pick the arm that has the best expected value, right? And so, so that suggests that we are more interested in simple regret. Um, and an algorithm like UCB is not something that you should use here. But, but this is one of those situations where I, you know, I'll, I'll, you'll review a paper or see a paper and they'll be using UCB for a situation exactly like this. And yeah, you know that you probably shouldn't do that, right? Because it's not really optimizing the right thing. So what, uh, what's, what's another, so if you were to pick a bandit algorithm now, what, what non-uniform bandit algorithm might you pick? Do you remember any others? It's new stuff. Uh, starts with epsilon. Epsilon greedy, right. I don't know what else, I don't know what other choices there were for that, that completion, but uh, so epsilon greedy, right? We could, uh, well, you could use median elimination. That, that would be a fancy thing for pack results, but epsilon greedy would be probably the, you know, a, a good choice. Because epsilon greedy, you can just say, all right, we have this much budget to make a decision, right? We, we can, uh, and, and that tells you sort of, well, how many, uh, how many of these little simulate, how many of these uh, calls can I make, right? Because you'll know the time it takes to do each one of these. Each one of these requires evaluating, the, running the policy and then running the simulator. So you would say, I have, I, I know how much of those, I, how many of those I can do, and that will tell you uh, how many arm poles you can, can do. And then you just do epsilon greedy for that number of times. And at the end, you return the arm that looks best. All right, so, so th this is, is pretty effective. Um, in practice, it's much more effective than, than just doing uniform. That's, uh, that I can tell you. All right, so, so this, this is a very practical algorithm to, to, to know about. Um, we're going to be we're going to be using it as a wrapper later on um, for, for that, that involves some machine learning, um, but uh, but in its own right, it can be very effective. Start with any policy you want, and it will usually improve improve that policy, um, even if you start with random. Uh, it feels strange that you could. Uh, I told you if you do cart poll with this. Um, and you start with a random policy, it will be non-trivial. It will give you non-trivial results. It seems kind of crazy because a random policy just seems like it's just going to fail completely. But, but what happens is in cart poll, so you guys will, will see this in your, your homework, but cart poll is this cart that goes back and forth, and you get to choose whether to put force to the right or the left, and you're trying to balance a poll. And so, so rollout, policy rollout is just going to try, you know, let's move it to the left, let, let's give force to the left, and then we're going to act randomly, and force to the right and act randomly. And what, what happens is if, if the poll happens to be leaning a little bit this way in your state, um, it's just going to happen that if you push it to the left and, and then act randomly, it's going to survive a little bit longer than if you push it to the right and act randomly. And so it turns out that this random policy is a reasonable heuristic about, about what the future is going to entail uh, to give you good guidance. And so that, that's why it works. But there are lots of problems where that random policy doesn't give you the good guidance and, and, and random rollout starting with random won't work very well. Yeah. But, but you, you'd be surprised at how often that random policy heuristic just gives you non-trivial information. Um, yeah, we, all, we also saw that with uh, Go, right? We, we, when we were talking about Go and, uh, or maybe, yeah, I guess we haven't got there yet, but, uh, but it, Go boards, a famous heuristic is basically you have two monkeys playing random games from a particular state and you see which one wins more often and that's a pretty good heuristic for a Go board position, um, believe it or not. So uh, that, that was sort of one of the things that sort of got the go, the progress in go really started. Um, so we'll, we'll come to that. 
Um, all right, so so you can do some fancier things um, with with rollout. You can actually nest it because what we uh, what we saw here was basically simulating one iteration of policy iteration. Right, we were computing what we we're computing for a particular state what policy iteration would give us uh, at that state if we started with pi and, and did one iteration. But how about it would be nice if we could simulate multiple iterations, right? So here's a state. I want you to give me what policy iteration would say to do with this state if I started with this policy and ran policy iteration for k times, um, k improvement steps. And obviously, there's going to be some computational cost here, right? You're, you're not going to do that for free. Um, and it's going to be pretty substantial, but, but you can do it. Um, so... So for, for this part, let's just say we're, we're going to use this rollout pi uh, notation as just our notation for, you know, a rollout procedure. It could be uniform, could be epsilon, whatever, but we're just abstracting that. And a single call to rollout at a state approximates one iteration, as I said. We'd like to nest these calls. You can actually nest these calls. Um, and uh, let, let's see what that looks like. So in other words, um, let, let's, let's just think about this. What we'd like to do is instead of putting pi in here, we'd like to put in rollout of pi, right? Rollout of pi is a policy, right? And so we should be able to just put it into um, this function as a policy and do rollout on it. And that will simulate two iterations of policy iteration. Um, I actually have a library that, you know, is set up nicely. So you can do this. You, you, you can define an agent and agent is just a policy and you can nest these things arbitrarily um, deeply. So, so you can produce highly intractable policies, but we can get them very quickly. Right? So that, They'll, uh, because when you nest these, it gets pretty expensive. But this is what it looks like if you want to try to visualize what's going on. So, so a nested rollout, each of these dots, in order to select the action at this dot, is going to have to run rollout. So, so, so each of these dots is not not a cheap thing anymore, right? You're going to have to actually run rollout to simulate the policy um, going down here if you're going to nest these rollouts. And so each of these dots is going to require KHW um, calls to the simulator to compute the action of rollout. And there's going to be, you know, we know there's going to be KHW number of dots. And so basically two stages, two nested stages is going to be KHW squared. And if you want to do three stages, Right? You could have rollout of the rollout of the rollout of pi. It's going to get more and more expensive. So, so that's, but, but you can do it, and, uh, and you just have to know it's going to cost you more. And so here's, this is actually a fairly old paper now, um, NIPS 04, where they, they sort of looked at this and did this, and it's kind of an interesting application. Um, so... So this was, yeah, back then they were they were kind of interested. Some people were interested in solitaire, and in particular, knowing anything about the probability of winning a hand of solitaire, right? So, so given a uh, given a deck, what fraction of the decks can you actually win win at? And and to to figure this out, they would uh, they would uh, do something called thoughtful solitaire, where they, you know, people would, would look at, they would play solitaire with cards that you could actually see. Um, and then, you know, uh, you're, you're probably, probably the win rate there is going to be a bound on the win rate if you can't see the cards. So, so, so people were interested in this. And uh, these folks decided to um, use Monte Carlo ideas to try to get some, some idea about what fraction of the decks you could win at. And so what they did is well, there, there were some human experts that played a lot, and this is sort of their success rate 
took them about 20 minutes per game for thoughtful solitaire. You know, they probably weren't playing optimally at all. They, they certainly weren't. But uh, what they did is they then um, created a very naive base policy, right? And they did this. It was just a rule-based policy. Like, you know a little bit about solitaire and you just create a set of rules that do reasonable things and avoid stupid things. Um, but it's going to be highly non-optimal. Uh, and that base policy was extremely fast, right? You could play a game in 0.021 seconds, um, and it had a success rate of 13% um, of random decks. Now, now, one thing that they might have done is they could say, okay, now we're going to try to make this policy even smarter. We're going to make new rules. We're going to think harder, and you know, who knows what, what you would do to try to improve it. But uh, instead of doing that, they said, oh, well, we have a simulator for – for solitaire, right? That's easy to get at. And we're just going to do rollout. So we're, we're, we're going to stop with this naive policy. We're not going to think anymore. We're just going to put it in a rollout loop. And what you see here is that when you do just the one stage rollout that we talked about, uh, we start with this naive base policy. It jumps up to a success rate of 31%, right? Almost to the human level. And it, still is only taking, you know, under a second of time. So that, that's a pretty big improvement already, right? Just, and, and you didn't have to think. Um, if they had been able to, you know, if they had taken the time to try to write rules that got to this point, you know, who knows if they ever would have got there. Um, maybe they could have, but, but it would have been kind of annoying and not really worth a whole lot. Um, so two stages of rollout, right? So you take this policy and now you wrap another stage around it, they jump up to 47%. You see the times increasing quite a bit, seven seconds per game. Uh, three stages, you jump up even more. So you, you see the, the improvement is pretty substantial, right? But now you're kind of getting into games are taking way too long. Uh, but, but for 18 minutes, which, I mean, this was, I mean, probably this would be down to, under minutes now, um, then, uh, then, you know, they're doing much better than the human who's taking 20 minutes um, as well. So, so this is a nice little example of, of the, uh, the sort of the benefit that rollout can give you. And, and you, you will see this, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, seven times out of 10, if you have a problem where you have a policy in a simulator, you'll see this type of improvement. So, so definitely worth checking out. Um, and, and the other thing is, I mean, would you, would you say that this is a fairly uh, parallelizable algorithm? Right? I mean, if you think about just uniform rollout, you just you can do everything in parallel almost, each decision step. So, so uniform rollout, uh, so where you're just taking you know, an equal number of actions uh, equal number of trials per action, that is perfectly parallelizable. Like as many CPUs as you have, you can run them all in parallel. And so that that can really uh, reduce your time. Uh, so, so that makes it extra um, beneficial. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting. This The Epsilon Greedy, this, this technically is not parallelizable if you want to simulate Epsilon Greedy exactly because... Uh, the greedy action depends on the previous trial. But in practice, you would probably do something like, oh, I'm going to, you know, given what I know now, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to you know, generate half random actions and half greedy actions and just simulate them. Then you'd update your knowledge and, and go ahead and, and uh, do the next batch. So that's another nice thing about this. Highly parallelizable. And if, if we were, uh, if we had, been able to, uh, I would have had a, an assignment here where you do uh, uh, in Ray, uh, you, you would do this. And this, this would have actually been really easy to implement. Uh, 